Okay, if you got your Bibles, please uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 9, please. Ezekiel chapter 9. So it's a short chapter, but I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll get into the study here. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, and every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they, went, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord, God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, throughout the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the, all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, when I, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city is full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. God, thank you for your word, and thank you for all of the great things that you give uh, to us, all the blessings that you've given to us. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Lord, to die on the cross for us. We pray that you'll help us to get something from this passage tonight, and help us to uh, learn, Lord, how we will, uh, should walk before you and, and what pleases you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just a little bit of context here as I was reading this passage. Um, Actually, I, mean, I read this many years ago, and I never forgot this passage. But, uh, but Ezekiel uh, was a prophet toward the very late part of Israel's history, and um, he was given many visions by God. And this is, I find, very exciting reading. And uh, I wonder if your Bible reading's been exciting lately, or, or ever, because uh, there's so much in the Bible. I love to tell people, uh, there's nothing on TV like this. It's, it's, uh, it's wonderful reading. Uh, I also love the book of Daniel very much. But um, it doesn't really mean that when you see amazing um, visions and things in the Bible that you're really necessarily getting what God's trying to tell you. But, um, but getting something from the Bible really has a lot to do with, first of all, your relationship to the Lord. Are you saved? The second thing is it has to do with your fellowship. Um, are, you out of, are you walking out of obedience to the Lord? So those things can really affect your Bible reading. Um, and they can affect whether you even have any Bible reading going on in your life. But the good news is that you can ask the Lord to renew that. Often when I read the Bible and I pray, I, I ask the Lord to, con to, um, to just really grip me with his word so I'll continue to go back to it, and, and I'll continue to want to go back to it. Sometimes our flesh doesn't always want to, but, but he, can, he can bring you along in those times where you, where you waver. So um, here God shows uh, Israel, shows Ezekiel why uh, the nation's going to be punished. And uh, the previous chapter, chapter 8, shows him specifically. He takes, them, takes him and shows him in visions as he 
uh, rips open the wall of the, the temple and everything to see the, the things that are being done inside the temple that were not his worship. They're not the worship that he ordered. Uh, they had idols set up. They had all kinds of different things going on. Um, and they had put in place of God that which was not God. He showed uh, Ezekiel there are many sins here. And uh, so when we get into the next chapter, and he's pouring out, he's showing uh, actually just a vision of the, the punishment he's going to pour out on him. Uh, he has to again remind Ezekiel, I showed you. You know why this is happening. Okay, so this is very late in Israel's history, uh, and before the uh, captivity to Babylon, or just about prior, uh, just right before it. And uh, Ezekiel himself was actually taken away into captivity. Uh, so in this chapter, we see God sends six men. And uh, these six men are probably likely angels, but one of them he sends not to destroy. He sends with a different purpose. And I don't know if you saw that, but in, uh, in the second verse there, he sends uh, this man clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And he w they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. This man was to go forth and mark those. Uh, let's look at verse 4. So verse 4 says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Okay, so he sends the other men to kill and to destroy because of all their sin and rebellion. But this man with the writer's inkhorn is sent to identify those that should not be killed. Why do they have to be identified? Okay, so we just saw in verse 4 that they are the ones that sighed and cried for the abominations done in the midst thereof. So in the city and in the nation of Israel, these were the people that were saddened by the sin that was going on in the land. Okay, so the first uh, thought I want to share with you is about a biblical response to sin. So first of all, sin in general. So we can see from this passage and through the whole Bible that God is very serious about sin. Okay, are we very serious about sin? Okay, we need to be very serious about sin. All right, and because we need to think as God thinks, and as we, we, we know um, that if God is against it, so am I. That's because, um, and that's, that's the thought we need to have as we walk in through our lives as Christians, that God's thoughts should be what our thoughts become. And so uh, the word sin we see is in this chapter. Well, no, abomination is the word in this chapter. But the word sin is throughout the Bible. The idea of sin is throughout the whole Bible. Sin is everywhere in the world. I just went to the other side of the world. It was there. I don't know if you knew that, but I just thought I'd come home and let you know. Sin is there. Sin is all over the place, right? So that means, um, that means people need to be saved. And uh, as Jeremiah tells us in chapter 17 of Jeremiah, he says sin is in our hearts. He says that, uh, behold, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know um, how bad we can be. We, uh, we tend to think that... Somebody we say has a such so and so has a good heart, um, if that were that were only true, and uh, and people say we know I know your heart I know you may have good intentions and that's true at times but really deep down the human heart can't really be good it can't be made good it has to be changed so God sees what goes on in this world and nothing escapes His attention and there are no unsolved mysteries with God have you ever seen the TV shows that say unsolved murders and things like that. God knows the answer to them all. And if there weren't a God, then what kind of world would this be? Because those, those sins would never be brought to account. Okay? But we know there is a God because the Bible tells us so. And he's going to deal with all the unsolved mysteries. Okay? So let's go uh, look at another passage real quick. Uh, Proverbs 15, please, verse 3. Okay, Proverbs 15, verse 3, and it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So the eyes of the Lord are in Grove City. They're in Krasnoyarsk, the Republic of Tuva in Russia, Hakasia. They're in China. They're everywhere. God can see uh, the sin that's done in this world. But also we see back in Ezekiel, we saw that God sees, um, sees those that sigh and cry. We can go back to Ezekiel now. But um, God, God sees those that... Um, that are his, okay? So we'll talk about that as well. But, um, but God is serious about sin. We've, we've seen that already. How serious is God about sin? He sent his only son to bear our sin on the cross. That's how serious he is. Why would he go to that extreme? But he's so serious about sin, he wants to remove it from our lives. 
And uh, really, the, the, the reason he sent his son, Jesus Christ, is that when he... So he had to come as man to, to substitute, to die for men. But he couldn't just be a man to come and die for our sins. He had to be God himself to come and die for our sins. Otherwise, he could not satisfy that standard of God. So that's, that's, what, that's what, that, what the real purpose of, of him being God is about. So, but about sin, though. When you sin, does it upset you? Does it grieve you? Do you even notice? So that happens really. The only re- real way we can get our minds on thinking the way the Lord wants us to think is as Romans 12 tells us, uh, to renew our minds, to read God's word, to pray to him. First of all, we have to be saved to be in a right relationship with him. But we have to grow through reading his word and through prayer, through being around his people and sitting underneath the scripture, uh, the preaching from our pastor. That's the man he's, God's given to us to hear. So that can, that's not going to happen. And you're not going to think the way God thinks unless you're, unless you're following after him. So it probably bothers you when other people sin, right? I remember hearing a, uh, an uh, evangelist one time that had said to a, was witnessing to a guy and he says, yeah, have you ever lied? Have you ever told a lie? It's like, oh, yeah, well, everybody's told lies. Okay, well, what is somebody who tells lies? Well, so it depends on, you know, the guy starts writing all this stuff. He says, well, the guy says, he stops him. He says, what would you call me if I, call, if I lied? He says, well, you're a liar. So he's a lot, a lot easier to call me one, isn't he? <laughs> so it's a lot easier for us to see sin in other people uh, rather than ourselves. It's easy to see sin in, in our nation and in other nations. And, um, but how do we respond at that point? So this scripture says in verse 4 again, and I'm going to read it. This is a great verse. It's, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark on the fo- upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. I know we get upset about sin in our nation because we get, on, we get out on Facebook and we start, can you believe the politicians? Or can you believe the media and all this? And we start tweeting about it all. But do we pray for them? You know, it's, we do, but we don't, we don't do it enough, I think. And I don't think that um, many of us do it all. So we really, we really need to think about that because God's telling us right here that's what he wants done. He wants he wants prayer, and he doesn't want he doesn't want to have a flip attitude about sin. He wants us to be serious about it, and uh, so it should make us sad. It should grieve us, and we shouldn't allow it in our lives. That's another point. We shouldn't allow it in our lives. So we, you know, we get to the point where we we have uh, a long time ago when I used to listen to a lot of bad music. I would be listening to songs, and I'd sit there and I'd hear the words. And then I would tell myself, if I were in a conversation, I wouldn't be speaking that, or I, want, I wouldn't want to say that. Because I was, but I was kind of mesmerized because there was rhythm to it. Then I didn't turn it off right away. But that's, that's kind of putting up with, that's tolerating sin. We need to make sure, we do, as soon as the Lord tells us that sin, and that doesn't please him, we need to be quick about removing that. Okay? Otherwise, he'll have to do it himself. And then it's going to hurt a lot more. So we shouldn't be watching movies about this stuff. We shouldn't be singing songs about it. Um, we just shouldn't allow it in our lives at all. Separation from sin is critical for you to become closer to the Lord. So we can pray for God's will and his mercy, and that's, uh, that's obviously what we're seeing in the text here that he wants us to do. We can pray for his mercy upon this country. I've been in, I've been in conversations before. I've told people, oh, I can't believe the country's doing this and doing that. And uh, that, that day I hadn't prayed for it. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't been spending the week, the, the month, the year praying for those things. Uh, we, we, uh, you know, we get all, we get real... We get real excited about politics, and we decide picking them off. Now nah, that one's not going to do any good. But we didn't. We need to pray for God to lead our nation again, and uh, we can do that now, even though it's 2017. And as far as things look, uh, it looks like it looks pretty bad, right? I mean, but God can God can turn turn people at any time, and uh, we need to be looking for and hoping for Him to do that. That's His will. We don't. God wants to restore, and He wants to save. He. Do, it's not really what he would love to do to wake up and just start swatting people and everything. He wants to restore us. And if we're backslidden, even more he wants to restore that. So, but if we're all still breathing, so we, God can do that in our lives. All right? So we can also tell people um, about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. 
So that's, that's really, I think, what this patch is, is telling us is what our, our response to sin needs to be, that we would pray, and we would, we would not just run and just start gabbing with people about, about what we see. We should get on our faces first. All right, and the other, another thought that I want to share with you out of this is that God knows those that are his, okay? Again, in verse 4, he says, Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations done in the midst thereof. He didn't have to go back and look and try to find out what was that guy's name again. He's, he comes to church every couple months. He knows. He knows all of your names. He knows, he knows his sheep. God's a shepherd. He calls them by name, the Bible says. And if you've read 1 Chronicles 1, I know you get through, you're reading your Bible through in a year or something, you get to 1 Chronicles 1, he's the whole not, first nine chapters minus a couple of passage, short passages here and there's just a whole lot of genealogy, a whole lot of names. But there's a reason for it, okay? Many genealogies exist in the Bible, and God has not forgotten any of these people. So many of these people maybe didn't even walk with the Lord, but he still knows all their names. And if you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, and you're walking with him, you're a Christian, there's no way he's forgetting your name. He's remembering you. And so he knows those that are his here in Grove City and in this church. He won't, he won't forget you. Okay? I hope you know that today. Maybe you don't. Maybe you've forgotten about that. But he won't forget you. So keep looking to him and keep looking to his word. You know, Maybe you're going to go through a trial. Maybe you're in one right now. I remember one time when I was going through a trial, the thing I thought about was, man, I just want this to be over with. And I... Uh, I probably could have prayed a whole lot more through it, but uh, you know, I was just was consumed with my own situation. And I was I think I had told the teens this, I don't know, maybe I didn't, but but you know, when you're when you're going through trial, you're praying for things, you're like, man, God, just get me out of this. You you go and you pray and you're like, ah, oh, and then you lose it. And you're like, oh man, I can't say that anymore. And then a little while later he gets you out of it. What well, it's always just a little bit later than you think. When you want when you want an answer an answer to prayer, it just tends to always I, I've noticed this at least that it's you think it should be in this time frame, but God's like, you know, it's just like a, just right after that I was going to answer the prayer. You lost heart. You gave up. You kind of just said, ah, you know, but we need to just keep waiting on him. He's good, all right? He's good. He'll, he'll not forget you. So let's look at another chapter, uh, another passage that will explain this a little bit more. John chapter 10, please. John chapter 10, and we're going to do, let's see, John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. Okay, 27 through 29. Jesus here speaking says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father which gave me, them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to forget about you. Okay, so we can follow him. We know that he's worth it. We know that he's good. Okay, so you've, even if you've not seen enough examples and you've probably just forgotten, let's not count on those either. Okay, we, we can look at those for a testimony, but we can count on his word. The things he tells us here are true. All right, so he will never forget us, especially those of us that have put our faith in, in Jesus Christ, his son. And uh, those who have forsaken their sin and come to him in repentance and faith. All right, so back to Ezekiel again. I do this to the teens all the time, hopping around. But let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 9. And, uh, and again, that, that verse 4, I just keep coming back to it. It's for those who sigh and cry. He knows those that are his. He didn't, he didn't have to go looking for them again and figure out, hold on a minute. So he won't forget. All right, and one... Those, when, we, when we seek to serve him with our lives, then, uh, then we, start seeing, we start seeing his picture rather than just our picture. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, there's, there's, you imagine like your, your windshield, okay? And you've got, uh, you've got maybe a whole bunch of bugs on it or whatever. But you see the windshield, and we tend, to see, we tend to not be able to see through that windshield of our life. You know, there's a little corner up here where we're thinking about the Lord, and up in the top right where the wiper doesn't usually get up there. But... Uh, but but all we see is just stuff in our life, right? We see stuff about work. We see all oh, these friends, and they're picking on me all the time. Or, you know, I'm, I have to sit across from this guy who just keeps, keeps taking the Lord's name in vain while I'm at work all the time, right? But we, we uh, and then we think about, well, you know, I got bills coming in. 
But, you know, we don't see that there's a little bit of a corner up here where once in a while we're thinking about the Lord and what he wants to do in our lives. You know, the more time you spend with the Lord, and if you're really going through it, you know, you need to find at least 30 minutes or something. You get, get along with God and just say, okay, all of my problems, later. You know, sit down with the Lord, sit, look into his word, and he'll start clearing that stuff up. All right? He'll at least give you perspective. Okay, so then what you're going through, you know, he'll help you to kind of see through it. Like, you know, God's going to help you through it, and it, it, it's going to get better. All right? But if we trust him, he can help. If we don't trust him, it's going to be a little bit longer probably before he helps us. So, as we saw in verse 4, God sees those that sighed and cried for the abominations, but these are the saved people, right? These are people that are sensitive to sin and think as God thinks. Uh, as I said, that's only going to take place when you spend time with him, all right? This is only possible when, our, first of all, our faith is in Jesus Christ. Second, when our fellowship, when we are in fellowship with him through his word and through prayer and through, through a certain amount of obedience, okay? And in verse 5, let's look at this. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 5. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, and let, your eye not, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin in my sanctuary. Okay. So the other five were sent through the city after this man to destroy and to kill. So what should we do, okay? So this is, obviously, this is a, a time in history that was previous, but the same truth is still true. Um, there will be a judgment, okay? So we need to think as Christians, we know already about that, okay? If you've ever read the book of Revelation or much, much of the New Testament, that, that judgment is talked about through, throughout several places. In Hebrews 9, it says that uh, for all... Um, all, all will uh, give an account to the Lord. So let's look at that. Hebrews 9, verse 27, please. Okay, he, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered... So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And at that time, when he comes again, that will be when he judges the earth, and he will judge all. And, uh, but when we die, if, it may, if we die before he comes, it will be even sooner for, for us. So we will we'll see, we'll know others, people in our lives that are going to stand in that judgment, and it's going to be a different judgment from the Christians. So God's judgment will come upon this world again, and he's given us a picture of that in, in Ezekiel 9. Then God's wrath is fierce, and his judgment on sin will be thorough. He's not going to miss one thing. Okay? When, uh, when people uh, take his name in vain, I hear it all, da- all the time at work, you know, the, the Bible says a couple different places. It says first that every idle word of man sp- spoken, will be, he'll give account thereof on the day of judgment. And then in the second second. Um, in, uh, in Deuteronomy, where he gives the, the Ten Commandments again, he says that he will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. God hasn't forgot one time that that's happened. Okay? So judgment also, Peter tells us, First Peter 4, that judgment will begin at the house of God. And that's, uh, that's the building. Okay? So the building that we meet in, um, or the building that, that any churches meet in, folks meet in, you know, God's, God's, God's got some things to say to the churches. Okay? So we see that in Revelation. That uh, it's not you know God, we may all get together and, and talk about Jesus, but you know he's he's still got things to say to us. Now it's not the same judgment if we're saved, but he's uh, he's looking for fruit from our lives. Okay, he's looking for fruit from the lives of Christians, and uh, you know he deserves it. By the way, he's uh, he's done so much for us. He sent his only begotten Son to bear our sins upon the cross that we might believe uh, and be saved and be forgiven and saved from hell. He always shows mercy in all he does as well. I've been going through the prophets in the Sunday school class with the teens, and just about, I mean, every, t- every prophet that I read, I see God showing, I'm going to judge them, I'm going to do this, I'm going dist- to send them out of the land. A- and then he always, at the end of that, he always says, but at a certain time, I'll restore you to the land. 
That's his grace. You know, he's got grace for you today, in case you forgot that. He's got grace for you. Still breathing? He's got grace for you. And he's going to show mercy to you, but you have to go to him. You have to go to him, first of all, for salvation. If you've never believed, if you've never called upon him for salvation, I think that's a really key verse in Romans 10. For, uh, you know, we talk about, um, I asked him into my heart, and we say different things meaning, relig- meaning being saved, um, you know, but that scripture says that we should call upon him. You know, that's, that's really clear what we, what we need to do to be saved. We need to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so that's, that's where he's going to show mercy, but he's also going to show mercy in our lives as Christians. So we, we don't always walk perfectly the way he wants us to, but he'll, he'll, re- he'll restore you, okay? Don't forget that. Now, for you and me, though, as Christians, we are, uh, I remember seeing a, a, a tract, and I think we used to have it here. I don't think we do now. Maybe I saw it at a different church. I forgot, but it said, saved, sure, and serving. And that's kind of the, you know, one of the ways we, we see it in, as a Christian. So, first of all, we've got to be saved. You know, if you're not saved, that's first order business. You've got to get saved. Second, after a certain amount of time, you're sh- you become sure of that, okay? God gives you assurance. He helps you to understand that, yes, I'm saved, absolutely. I don't have any questions about it anymore, and my life is not going to be about that question anymore. Like, really, did I get saved or not? So God's going to help you at some point to really figure that out. And The more you spend time with him, the more you're going to know. The more you're in sin, the more you're going to not know. You're not going to know the answer to that question. So you gotta, you got you to seek his answer on that. But the third, the third thing is serving. Once you've found out, yes, once you've been saved, you've gotten yourself set on that path, then you serve the Lord. Okay, he's got a job for you to do, and uh, he's given us all a gospel to take to the world. And, that can st- and he's, he's specifically said to do it in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, everywhere. So if, if they're out there, every creature, right? We got a rabbit, but I don't preach to her that much. But every human being, we need to be given the gospel too, okay? Anybody, you know, it, sometimes we need to take a little bit of time to, you know, get, get to know the person. But, but as, uh, as another missionary said that I heard, we need to speak about Jesus uh, often and, uh, and openly. We don't need to be covert with people, even in Russia. I think we were kind of concerned they passed different laws. We don't know what we can do. But, uh, but you know what? He's worth it. It doesn't matter. So we can, you know, we need to tell the gospel to folks right in our neighborhood the folks that we work with, folks we see at the store all the time, why do you go to that same dry cleaner all the time? Why do you, as a Christian, keep going to that same place and that same person's waiting on you every time? You know, I, I, I'm amazed at the opportunities that fly by me, and I don't, I'm like half asleep. It's like I have spiritual jet lag or something, and the Lord's trying to tell me, here, this person, you've seen this person all the time, and then they've walked you know, away, and here I am going, huh, oh, you know, we... We need to be more ready. You know, we need to clean that windshield and get more ready for the Lord to put people in our path. He does it all the time. You know, then we see we sit there realizing 20 minutes later that was an opportunity. You know, we need to spend more time with the Lord so that He can He can prompt us and, and let us know. Hey, talk to that person. Talk to that person. And we can prepare ourselves for that. We can start. You know, we can learn His Word a lot more once we memorize more Scripture. It He'll bring it up like crazy. I mean, I've been I've been in places where, I mean, I know I haven't read the, the Japanese Bible in a little while. I've been reading just a little bit, but I still remember verses that I memorized in Japanese. And uh, it's the same thing with any other language. If you don't speak another language, that's all right. But uh, if I were staying here, boy, I'd be learning Spanish. I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm trying to learn to give the gospel in Spanish at least, if I can't even understand after if they ask me questions about it. I want to give the gospel at least in Spanish. Um, I'm trying to do that in Russian. But, it, but anyway, you know, you can learn it in sign language. You can learn um, you can just learn it, you know, just learn at least in English, first of all. But the gospel, you know, John 3.16, right? John 3.36. Those are, those are great verses. If you don't have more verses, at least look at those. All right? We still have time for, for you and me. We still have time to share the gospel with, Jesus, with people uh, that we see on a regular basis. But how much time do we have? Okay? Anybody know? Yeah, so that's up to the Lord. We don't know. But let's look at 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 5. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, please. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 
Okay, we just read that. We just saw that, that what God will, God's going to do in the future, uh, when, he's, when, his, when his clock is up, now he doesn't work in time like we do, but he's got a day set where Jesus is going to come back, that's it. All right. So we need to be doing as much as we can before that. I'm about 39 years old. I was 22 when I was saved, wasted those years. I was 22, trying to catch up now, trying to serve the Lord with my life. But here I am, 39. I heard a guy at work say to me the other day, that he was uh, 33 or you know, four, I think he's 40 or something. He's like, I'm, a, I'm already half done. You know, and he's not a Christian that said that to me. So I started thinking, oh, man, i got to get busy. we got to be busy serving the Lord. And, you know, I, I tend to do this. I tend to wait for kind of a smooth kind of inroad with people and so it's not awkward. We're going to have to get over that. I'm going to have to get over that. The Lord dealt with me last weekend about that. He's like, you know, you're going to have to just, it's not time when you're out soul winning or whatever to make friends. It's time to give them the truth. You're probably not going to see the person again. Hopefully you'll see them in heaven. But you may not see them again in this life, or maybe you will. But, you know, it's, you know I have a real thing where I'm dealing with the Lord on that, about, about just trying to get out of my shell and, and speak more to folks. But, um, but, but how much time we have, still that's up to the Lord. And uh, we know that it's going to be a terrible thing when that judgment comes. We just saw that, and then Second Corinthians just reminded us of that. So how much time do we have? We don't know. But let's tell our friends and family now about Jesus Christ uh, because, um, you know, one day it'll be too late. So in, this, in, this, in the next verse there, uh, chapter, uh, sorry, in the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 2, let's read that. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, today is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Okay. I hope we're going to get to the field before he comes, but I don't know. So, you know, we try to, try to give the gospel to people, okay? So let's look at those verses and about the gospel, and then we'll close. So John chapter 3, verse 16, if you need it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is, con is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. If we go and we tell folks the gospel and we tell, you know, some people we tell them over and over and over and they've heard the gospel six, seven times and they continue in their life and in their rebellion, they, come, they don't come to the Lord for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. All that's left is the wrath that we just, talk, we just saw. God's given them opportunity. The last verse there, verse 36 of chapter 3, John. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So you probably looked into the eyes of somebody like that recently. I do it all the time. I know folks. So you know, we, got a, we, we got a mission, okay? It's not just the mission field, but it's the same mission for all of us. It's right here. We know it. Okay? And these of you folks have probably been in church their whole life, know the gospel, and are still not saved. They can tell others how to get saved. But it's, you know, we're going to run out of time someday. And you're going to run out of time if you're not saved. So I encourage you, pray to the Lord. Ask him, first of all, to save you. Second, if you're saved, ask him for that assurance and help him, ask him to help you, show you where you can be used. Okay? There's a lot of work to do out there. All right, thank you. What a good message. Do you hate sin as much as God hates sin? Do you hate sin enough to go by the track rack as you leave and pick up some tracks to give to someone, the first person you run into tomorrow? Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Do you hate sin like God hates sin?
that we clean the glass like Brother Xavier said. To ask God to help you to hate sin like he hates sin. If there's one here tonight that does not know for sure that if they had dropped dead before they had hit the parking lot that the wrath of God would be upon them and that they would not be in heaven. I encourage you to come forth and let someone take God's word, the truth, and show you how you can know before you leave here tonight that you have an eternal destination and that's to be with the Lord in heaven. And you can be sure when you lay your head down tonight as Nancy plays, ask yourself. You have the opportunity to make things right. Okay, everyone look this way. Take your hymnals if you don't know this song, page 128, page 128. We'll close with this, the closing song, The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. Amen. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm leaving on Jesus from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir as soon as you can. Xavier said it's going to be sweet and quick. <laughs>